Hello everyone, welcome to video 12 of chapter 3. In this video, we will look at the third case. Um, this is the case where the coefficient a i k is not all negative or zero, so it's strictly positive for some index i. So let's look at it. So for each of such index i, and if a i k is strictly bigger than zero, we know that we will get this constraint x k will be less than b i over a i k. And then we know b i and a i k are both positive, so the right hand side is a positive number. And x k is bigger than zero because it's a restricted variable, so this inequality here becomes a real constraint. Okay, so here will be the strategy if we are in this case. So we would need to find all these constraints going through all the coefficients a, i, k that are positive, find out what constraints do they give to me, and then we should find the largest possible value of x, k, such that all the constraints are satisfied. Okay, we'll look into the details. Okay, so since the constraint is represented by this ratio, we have the following suggestion. We will compute this ratio, b, i over a, i, k, for all the indexes i such that a i k is strictly bigger than zero. So you might have only one of them or you might have a bunch of them, a several one of them. And then you're going, you're going to find the one that has the smallest value. Okay, so these will all be positive ratios. Among them, you find the one that's the smallest. Let's say um, s is now that index such that b s I'm sorry, um, b sub s over a s k, that is the smallest ratio among all those that you checked. Okay. And if that is the case, and then we will replace x sub s with x sub k as a basic variable. And now uh, let's take a look at um, what happens if we do that. If we do that, and now the basic variables are the following. xk is one of them, where this index k is bigger than m. That's uh, one of the non-basic variables. And then the xi's for i from 1 to m. That's the old basic variable set, except for the one that i equals s. So basically, you replace the x s here, take it out, and put the x k in. Okay. So at this basic solution, what will be the value of the objective function? Well, we would have z now will equal to negative z naught. And plus the additional value, c k x k. And... Um, and we know the xk is taking the value bs over ask. Okay. So recall that here ck is negative, and these b sub s and a sub sk, these are positive. So this red term is actually negative, which will make the z value decrease by that amount. Okay, so we see that this step we took by replacing xs with xk as a basic variable actually changes our objective function for the better, that is, z decreases. Okay, so let's summarize the discussion on the previous page into a theorem. This we call theorem m. M for method. This is the actual method. Okay, so let's read the statement. So in theorem M, we say in the linear programming problem I, 
assuming that there is an index k such that ck is less than zero, the, the one in the objective function, and then in the same column there, at least one of the a's are positive. So aik is positive for some index i. Okay, and now suppose that we have found an index s, which is between 1 and m, and this is the index such that this b sub s over a s k is the minimum of all these ratios um, that we talked about um, for i from 1 to m, and um, where a i k is bigger than 0, basically all these positive ratios, and this b of s, the index s, will give you the smallest one. And then if that is the case, then um, the LP problem can be put in canonical form with a new set of basic variables, which is the following. I would take the old set, i from 1 to m. Among them, I remove the one with i index equal s. And then I add xk also into the set. So the total number of basic variables are unchanged. So with this new um, set of basic variables, um, the value of the objective function will be expressed in this expression here. And then you will have this term, which is actually negative, and will make the z value smaller after taking the step. Okay, so this is an, um, a very important theorem, and which we will be using at every step of the simplex method. Okay, let's take a look at one case, which is a, a potential problem. We call this the degenerate case. Let's say for some um, index s, the b here is actually zero, and this is the one that you pick up for the ratio, because there the b over a will be zero, that will be the ratio you will pick up. And then if you switch the basic variables, what will happen to the objective function? Well, the value will be negative z naught plus this term, which now is zero because this term is zero. So it's still negative z naught. The z value remains unchanged after switching basic variable. So this is called degenerate case. The degenerate case could make the simplex algorithm more complicated. Let's consider the simple case that is non-degenerate. That is, we assume that all the bi's the right-hand side of the canonical form, they are strictly bigger than zero. So nobody is equal to zero. This is strictly bigger than zero for all i's. Then two things would happen. One is the minimum is unbounded, and the second is the minimum is bounded. Let's look into some details. So for case one, if the minimum is unbounded, then at some point, theorem u will apply, and the criterion there will be satisfied, and you will conclude, and you will stop the algorithm. For the second case, then likely what will happen is, unless you're lucky that your initial problem already is the optimal, and usually is not, then theorem M, the actual method for the simplex method, will apply possibly multiple times. And each time you apply it, then you would move from one basic solution to a different one. Why is it different? Well, because you know from the previous discussion that the z value will strictly decrease after that step. 
Therefore, it has to be at a different basic solution. Okay, so each time it becomes strictly less and you strictly make it better and move to a new point. So here comes the argument. Actually, this can serve as a proof for the algorithm. So we see that if you are strictly moving to a different one, then with finitely many moves, we will find the minimum. Why is that? Well, it's exactly because the total number of combination of basic variables, what would that number be? Well, we see that um, n is the total number of variables and m is the total number of basic variables. So it is m out of n, how many combinations you have, right? So it's exactly this this number that is n factorial over n factorial and n minus n factorial in combination. Okay. And then we know this is not a big number because number of equations and variables are just some number. So at most, after that many steps, you would have gone through all the basic variable combinations and... Uh, and then you for sure would have gone through the minimum, okay? And once you are at the minimum, then, then you will see that the optimality criterion would be satisfied, and then you apply that and stop your algorithm. Okay, so um, this discussion can actually serve as the proof for the simplex algorithm to show that in the case where the minimum is bounded, this algorithm will find the optimal point infinitely many steps in the non-degenerate case. Now let's have a, a little discussion on the degenerate case. Um, that's the case where some of the bi's could be zero. So from the previous discussion, we already know if some of bi is zero, then if you, if you move from one basic solution to the other, the z value might be unchanged. Then you don't know for sure that you are actually moving to a different solution. So in this case, it is possible to move through a circle of several basic solutions and you get stuck there. The phenomenon is called cycling. Um, if you're curious to see a concrete example, you can read Appendix B in your textbook when such an example is given. Okay. So in that case, then and you will not be guaranteed to reach the optimal point. You'll be stuck. Okay. So we still have some good news here. So in practice, cycling rarely happens. You have to very carefully prepare your problem for such a cycling phenomenon to occur. So we simply just rule out that case in our discussion for this class. Okay, so that's it. Um, we have completed the presentation of the theoretical aspect of the simplex algorithm. Okay, so well, hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you next time.